Hey, welcome everyone. My name is Bo. I am a resident staff member here at Hokyoji. And it is my pleasure to introduce Reverend Dokai Jorgensen. Uh, Dokai started practicing Zen with Dainin Katagiri Roshi in 1974, was ordained in 1984. He received transmission from Katagiri in 1989. He is currently the guiding teacher at Hokyoji and, and has resided there since 2003. He's the current president of the Soto Zen Buddhist Association, SCBA. So welcome, Dokai. The floor is yours. Thank you, Bo. Uh, all right. So... Today I'm uh, speaking from uh, at, uh, um, an article or a, a little chapter, I'll say a short, a short chapter on uh, a book um, by um, Seke Harada Roshi, edited by Daigaku Rune, called The Essence of Zen. And the title of this chapter is called what is this thing um, and uh, this thing is in uh, quotes okay. so this thing quotes which you think is yourself is neither you nor anyone else it is nothing whatsoever so i'll stop there for just a second uh, this statement uh, obviously emphasizes the um, the emptiness aspect of our lives. I so I'll back up for a minute and um, just tell you that sometimes this isn't so easy to grasp for instance um i um i ate something friday uh, afternoon that made me uh sick a little bit sick i've been having that problem a little lately since um since i had a covid incident in january that was uh manifested itself just with uh kind of uh, in intestinal symptoms, nothing respiratory. And I'm having a lot of trouble with uh, eating these days. Since then, just that uh, things don't look appetizing to me. But anyway, so that's, uh, so, so the reason I'm mentioning that is because uh, I wasn't, wasn't feeling too well uh, yesterday. And Friday night and yesterday, and of course, you know, I, I'm aware of the fact I had to give a Dharma talk this morning. You know, being sick is like, uh, mm, now what do we do about this situation? And um, so I had a pretty rough night last night. And, however, it worked out okay. All I did was just practice breathing in and out when I couldn't sleep. And then also, I, I I will chant the verse of repentance when I can't sleep. It's I don't count sheep, but I do uh, say the verse of repentance over and over. All the karma I have created, since of old, through greed, anger, and self-delusion, which has no beginning, born of my body, speech, and thought, I now make full open confession of it. Uh, that's not the version we chant now, but it's the one that I originally learned. It's the only one I know when I'm actually slightly unconscious. So, so uh, in any event, uh, so when I read this this morning, I, I thought, well, yeah, yeah, that's true. There's nothing there, but boy, sometimes it really does feel like there is something there. But let me go on. This thing which you think is yourself is neither 
you nor anything, anyone else. It is nothing whatsoever. <clears throat> it is the one and same with everything. I think uh, what he means by that, it's the same with every thing we see or differentiate in existence, like plants, flowers, trees, mountains, rivers, etc. Therefore, this thing is the most suitable expression to describe it. In other words, that's who we are. Just It's just this thing, this kind of thing that we try to figure out what's going on. The functions of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and thinking are functions of this thing and belong neither to you nor to anyone else. <clears throat> Our lives are constituted by the coming together of the tool-like functions of the six senses. I think he says tool-like as it to just uh, take any kind of personality out of it and just suggest it's just a, a, a working process. It's just uh, all that's happening as we live, as I understand it, is just a, uh, a continuous process that's occurring that never stops and never yeah, it never stops. It never resides for a moment in a particular place. Even, the, even if we think we're stuck somewhere, we're not really stuck. Things are constantly moving, even in our stuck, stuckness. This thing is comprised if we specifically divide it into this way of the physical body and the mind. The physical body is the shape or form, and cons it consists of the four elements, earth, water, fire, and air. All things are made of these four basic elements. Of course, uh, this is the old way of describing elements, but it's not so different from our newer, our new way, which is new way means now. Um, 2023 of, uh, you know, a hundred or, you know, there's more than a hundred elements. But everything so far that we know in the universe is comprised of these different elements uh, composed or constituted in different formations, different, uh, a different array of which, you know, we've all come to understand we, we all come from, you know, the original dust of the cosmos. And uh, Buddha said the same thing, just to, um, which was very impressive to me. He actually said it in a sutra. I didn't look it up, so I'll have to paraphrase. But he, he said, he said the same thing, this body that we have is composed of the four basic elements. And he just listed the same ones. But then he wanted to say that everything inside or outside of the body is also composed of these four elements. So that was really striking to me that in his day, he could understand that something like a tree or a rock is composed of the same elements that his own body was. I think that was novel thinking, particularly in his, his day and time. And when I read that, I, I was really, uh, really deeply moved by that. The Heart Sutra teaches that form, sensation, perception, formation, and consciousness, the five skandhas, are completely empty. The six sense functions, including thinking, enter through the medium of the physical body. 
The mental functions in turn arise upon the stimula stimulation of the body's six sense functions. I think you can see that the physical body and the mental functions do not work separately. I think we all maybe have a fairly good understanding or can see that there really isn't two separate things called the body and the mind. I mean, really, how could there be? You have to have a physical body to have a brain that creates a mind something that we call a mind. And you got to have a mind to create the consciousness that you have a body, because it's just an idea. But really, certainly there's no two separate things, and there might not even be this a real actual thing called a mind and a body that we have that's, you know, our own. <clears throat> Of the mental functions, consciousness is the one we must be we must be most careful of. Buddhist practice and training is based on a person clearly understanding the matter of consciousness because this is so important. Because this is so important, I would like to elaborate on it. <clears throat> the important point I would like you to grasp is that the moment you perceive or think of this thing, then this thing, or you, exists. The Agama Sutra, sutra um, and that he, the Agamas are the, the uh, a, a similar body of uh, Buddhist literature that could... Um, has a great amount of similarity to the Nikayas in the Pali tradition. And the Agamas are written in Chinese. And I've never read anything from the Agamas. Once I told someone, he was sort of a very, um, um, or maybe I told someone else, I'm reading the Agamas. And then that, uh, that person went to some pretty, uh, scholarly teacher and said, oh, Dokai's reading the Agamas. And that teacher said, oh, what language is he reading them in? <laughs> and uh, they haven't been translated into English, as far as I know, at least not the whole body. So, okay, I got caught. It's using the wrong term. It's the, my word is the Nikayas, which are translated into English from Pali. Mm. So here's, uh, again, I want to also say, this is probably the most, pro the, the reason I picked this uh, chapter to speak about is because of this next line. Uh, in the Agama Sutta, Nikayas, we find the following words. Because this thing exists, that thing exists. If this thing doesn't exist, that thing doesn't exist. Now, to me, this is the most important thing that the Buddha taught. And to my way of thinking, the Buddha really didn't teach a whole lot. We might, someone might disagree with me because they could pick up a book such as this with its um, uh, uh, 1386, 1,386 pages and know that there's five other books like this with more pages and say there's a lot of teachings in here. But when we read them, they're, they're not so complicated in a way. And I think they all come back to this very line. And I'm going to read it the way I remember it from the Nikayas. And it says, on the arising of this, there is the arising of that. On the cessation of this, there is the cessation of that. And basically, that's the whole teaching. And this teaching does have um, a kind of a slogan or a name. It's called conditioned 
arising. A conditioned, uh, just uh, conditioned, yeah, conditioned existence means it just on the arising of this, just on the whatever arises, there's the arising of something else. If that doesn't arise, then that other thing doesn't arise. And this, he comes to all, he, he uh, of course, he's always interested not in being theoretical, but how does he, can he teach to relieve our suffering? And so it comes, you know, it goes back uh, to the uh, full number two, four noble truths, two, um, or the, um, I think, uh, a, a more preferable way to say it, based on Glenn Wallness, the four preeminent realities. I, it's a, it's a, I like that expression more than the four noble truths. It's just preeminent reality. And, and the first of those preeminent realities, if we're born into this world as a human being, and probably we're born into this world as anything, any kind of thing, uh, there is no escape from suffering, from difficulty, no escape. That's a preeminent reality, but particularly as a human being. And why? It's because, at least according to our, you know, our understandings, at least in, on this earth, as far as we know, human beings have the uh, highest uh, level of consciousness of any species that we know of. At least that's what we think. And for, and for the time being, uh, that's, it kind of works that way. <laughs> if we think it's that way, that's probably just the way it's going to be, uh, even though it might not be true. But we don't know that. But we just don't see another species uh, able to mani manipulate the environment, destroy the environment as uh, well as we can. So <laughs> we think we have the highest uh, consciousness. I can do all the stuff we can do. So that this is, I believe, is just uh, the fundamental thing to understand. On the arising of this, there is the arising of that. So on the arising of craving, of our desire for something, there's going to be a, the rising of something else. And Essentially, it's going to be pain. If that doesn't arise, if the craving, for instance, I crave for, um, how about a really nice meal tonight? How about that? And then I don't get it for some reason or another. Then I suffer or I get something happens. But if I never have a, uh, a craving for having a nice meal, well, then I'm not going to suffer in that evening if I don't get one. But we can apply that to absolutely every thing we ever desire or want in this world. This explanation is consistent with the concept of emptiness that we find in the Heart Sutra that we chant each morning in Zen places, or with Buddha's teaching about wisdom. As it says, by perceiving the ego self, all things come into existence. That these things come into existence is not a problem in itself. It becomes a problem because we make it one. That is to say that before what I call I comes into existence, all things in the universe are already there, already here. With the coming into the existence of the ego self, the things, um, sorry, I got distracted. 
the things of the universe are perceived as objects. So that's uh, that's kind of on the arising of this, there's the rising of this. On the arising of the notion of consciousness, of an ego here, there are going to be the arising of objects that are not me. If there is no arising of an ego or of a something call that I perceive as myself. There won't be things I perceive as objects. There's continuous change. There's the meeting of a person, but it's not an ob it's not an objective experience. It's just what's happening what's manifesting. And if we don't have a, an idea, a concept that we're actually meeting a person and saying hello to them, and maybe we've known that person in the past, or maybe we don't, usually when we meet that person, we come into it with some idea, some consciousness of how we're going to respond. And that limits the way we can make a response by having the ideas about the person or about the problem, about the situation. Dogen said a surprising thing to me, although in the first I, 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 uh, I didn't like it. Like it was, of course, not a Good word, but not, I didn't, it said, I, I wondered or questioned it or something. But later I, I got to appreciate it. I mean, later means years and years of practice. But he said in the Shobo Genza once, being, uh, he called it the word unstained, he called it unstained. But unstained means there's not something going on where you're creating a, uh, a separate world objective world separate from yourself. That's what he means by unstained in this particular passage. He says, being unstained is like meeting a person and not caring what they look like or not evaluating what they look like. And I thought, man, that's kind of, isn't that basic, you know, to our human life? First time I read that is maybe about I don't know, 28 years old or something. So I had all these ideas, really, very strong idea. Everyone's equal, everyone's the same, you know, things like that. But as I go older, I said, well, no, <laughs> we all have our, our preferences and our likes and dislikes. And yeah, we're going to be looking. If someone's coming toward us, we're going to be looking at them. And we're going to be evaluating, oh, this person is Dozen. Oh, no, this person is Kyoku. <laughs> and uh, we're going to be saying, I wonder what Dozen's face looks like. Is he what? Is he smiling <laughs> or is he angry? And it's going to make a difference in our response, or theoretically, because we're always evaluating uh, the situation. And we do that all the time. We do it a lot, but so it's a real <clears throat> moment of freedom when we find ourselves not in that situation. Sometimes it's uh, for me it's it's more when I actually don't know the person. Might be like a checkout person at the uh, you know when we're checking out groceries or whatever, and they and they say something kind of nice to us that's maybe a little unexpected. Um, and uh, of course, uh, <laughs> it's it's a little bit, I have to say, I find it just a little bit amusing, but every, you know, when we go to stores now and we check out, the first thing that checkout person the way my experience is telling me, they ask you, did you find everything you were looking for? <laughs> it's like, geez, 
Now, that might be a really nice question to ask, but when every single clerk or a checkout person at every single store asks you that every single time before you even say the person, see the person, it's like, okay, they're being taught to do this, you know. Uh, and that's, a, that's okay. And of course, they're taught at the end to say, have a nice day or have a good rest of your day. But sometimes I can sense that someone's saying it from a different place than just their routine um, place. And, and sometimes I can just say, well, you have a really nice day too. I hope you do. And then they'll look back at me and start to, what? <laughs> like, what did you just say? <laughs> like, I was actually having a, a real moment of uh, connection with the person. So those things are, um, I think, uh, heartening. Okay, it's, it becomes a problem because we make it one. And that's because our ego self uh, arises and, and it's all, it's built into our evolutionary system to protect this, this little ego thing so that it can propagate, I think. I think that's, that's my, uh, of course, that's my uh, idea, but I think there's something, you know, going on beneath my consciousness that wants to thrive and uh, propagate. I haven't done so well with that. I don't have any kids myself, but uh, in any event, uh, it's a pretty deep desire. So we want to protect ourselves and protect our children and our family and those close to us. And when they get hurt by something, we get mad and angry and need to react or do react. That is to say that because, okay, I'll read the, the other sentence before, that things that these things come into existence is not a problem in itself. It is, becomes a problem because we make it one. That is to say that before what is called I comes into existence, all things in the universe are already there. With the coming into existence of the ego self, the things of the universe are perceived as objects. This per perception leads to the labeling of things as nature, mountains, rivers, trees, and grass. And I might also say, as enemies, or things to be, uh, to feel threatened by, or things to not be threatened by. People have mer merely labeled them as such. In the same way, humans have recognized and labeled all things, and by doing so, have brought about the separation between people and other things. Not to mention people and other people. While it often seems as if these things have been labeled by you are the cause of your confusion, in fact, is just the opposite. To think that the cause of the problem is anywhere other than yourself is a big mistake. Now, this is probably the hardest thing to realize. But, okay, I'll come back to that. Boy. Some people might reject to that, reject that idea, saying, no, no, this, this confusion, this uh, confusion is not about me, it's about another person doing something that's unjust, unfair, wrong. However, deep down, it's possible to see that any uh, stress or confusion we have, no matter what the outside circumstances are that we're experiencing, are generated by just me. 
you know, the Buddha would talk about things that make, let's say me, I'll just say myself, I don't know about you, make me very uneasy. For instance, if robbers come and they start chopping off your limbs and stealing your things, do not think any ill will. Okay, I'll, I'll work on that one. But uh, but he says it, and gosh, I think he actually means it. <laughs> I think he actually means it. He made up uh, one of these uh, rules where uh, you can't kill anybody, you know, if you're a Buddhist monk. If you do, you're eliminated from the order and uh, you can never come back again into the Buddhist Sangha. So one of them was kill somebody. Well, but what were the conditions under which this happened? They were that a monk was walking along and some people came along and they started throwing rocks at him and you know mimicking him and insulting him, pushing him down, pushing him over and doing all these things. and. And he couldn't take it anymore, so he pushed somebody away. They fell down. That they hit a rock. The head hit a rock, and he was and he died. The person died. So it was uh, labeled that um, uh, this person committed murder. This monk committed. So under those circumstances, if you kill somebody, and ima imagine all the other circumstances we could do. So he's really. Um, emphasizing that uh, even if you have to face death, uh, we don't mm, you know um, go into a reactionary mode. Maybe that by um, some kind of self-defense of better than others. It's like was it one of them I don't remember the name of it now, right now. It's a martial art that where you don't have to strike anyone, you just use their force to turn it against them. I don't remember the name of it right now. Uh, in any event, that's a pretty tough practice. But it's what we have to do over and over again. I'm not sure as we age or grow older in this life if things get more complicated or more simple. There's certainly ways in which things have gotten a little more complicated in my life in the past few years. Just more complicated issues to deal with. And when they're more complicated, it, it gives rise to having uh, difficult uh, feelings and emotions. So it just becomes our practice. And that's uh, why we want to practice under a situation that's not so complicated. And that's why we create uh, something like Hokyoji or an Arzendo. Not that Hokyoji isn't complicated. Even if we try to create a real simple situation, it gets pretty darn complicated sometimes. Here's another complication. I'll, I'll digress for a moment. We're doing a construction project here, and part of it is getting a propane tank down uh, at the new uh, construction site, the new uh, place where people are going to be residing. Well, they're doing a little work on my propane tank up here simultaneously at, at where place where I live, the building where I live. And in doing so, they didn't do it exactly right. And I came home uh, yesterday not feeling too good and also not having any heat in my place, nor any hot water, nor any thing, cooking gas. <laughs> so, but fortunately I have a, a space heater up in my room. So I'm in my little room here with my space heater. It took about four hours, but I did get the temperature up to about 65. So I'm uh, comfortable. Now, why did I digress like that? I Oh, I don't know. Just because it's in my life. In my, so that's like, okay, you got to deal with this. Now, that's not as hard as a lot of things, but it was a little challenging. 
when I arrived here. And I thought, nope, going back to lacrosse. <laughs> I just I had unloaded everything. And that takes me about a half hour. It's kind of a strenuous event. But then I thought, oh, I don't want to load the whole car up again and drive back. So I'm just trusting that the space heater is going to make things uh, tolerable. OK. To think that the cause of the problem is anywhere other than yourself is a big mistake. It is complete delusion. So really, if someone does something, you know, that we think is unjust or unfair to us, still, the actual problem is not the person, but it, the, the suffering just comes from, uh, we create that suffering inside of our own body and our own mind. And that's really important to uh, realize. Because if we can do that and see that, then there's a possibility that we can work with that uh, person who's creating the uh, suffering for ourselves in a different kind of way than just uh, fighting back. Finally, he says, trying to, I can't get it to work. I'm trying to check my time. Uh, hang on. Well, doesn't matter. Finally, he says, um, this is the proof of the statement that by investigating and examining yourself, all anxiety can be completely eliminated. Finally, he says, there is no doubt about this. But I have a feeling that um, there's going to be a, a disagreement, rebuttal from you about that. And that's what I'd like to talk about. So I don't know what our time is, but, and I can't seem to get make my computer tell me what it is. 10.08. Okay. 10.08? 10.08? Really? Already? Yep. Oh, okay. I did good. I thought it was like 10 to 8, or 10 to 10, or 8 to 10. But 10.08, oh, that's good. Okay, that's a good time to for me to stop and to uh, hear your comments. Uh, thank you for your talk today. You're welcome, Suzanne. Thanks for coming. So any comments? There's got to be. This time, there's got to be. I can understand that sometimes there wouldn't be, but this one, there's got to be. Okay, Jushin, take it away. I'll rebut. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure you can just... <laughs> I'm not sure you can just sort of... Uh, Zen all your anxiety away all the time. Um, when I was in my 30s, I think I started having panic attacks. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was precipitated by uh, when I used to go on retreat with in, in New York, um, they had property very much like Hokioji's and we were out in tents in like an open meadow, like is where the new buildings are. And there was a very bad thunderstorm that came through. And uh, for some reason after that, I just started having panic attacks. And, you know, I had, it was great. It was really not too, because uh, Kempo Tse Wong is like, go in and it's basically like dokusan you go i'm having panic attacks and da, da, da. and he goes well you know you can do this seven line prayer to guru padma sambhava and he goes and maybe you ought to see a doctor <laughs> so yeah i got on some meds and it uh, i still you know eventually i was able to get off them but i think yeah sometimes you need meds yeah no i don't disagree I, I think it would be a must. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we would have to uh, look at this statement. This is proof that the statement that by investigating and examining yourself, all anxiety can be completely eliminated. Um, yeah. I th Again, you know, he, he's, he's, there's always two sides to everything when we, if you give a Dharma talk, there's always another side. You could give another Dharma talk 
you know, and it'd be totally the opposite of what you you gave uh, the one time, giving another. So yeah, sometimes we have to go to the doctor, we have to get medications. Uh, my example, uh, I could use examples of men a mental things too in my own life, but I'll, I'll, for, I'll but I'll forgo those for right now, and I'll just use the physical. Um, <clears throat> For instance, I have high blood pressure, hypoten uh, hypertension. And it took me a long, long, long time to accept that I had to go on medication to control it. <laughs> I thought, all I need to do is either do exercise, watch my diet, or do meditation. <laughs> and it'll come down. And I tried that for a number of years. But everyone in my family has hypertension. <laughs> And uh, so I think it's a little genetic with which there's not much I can do about it, except take medications to keep it under control. And I can keep it under control with the medications. But it was um, the fact that I denied uh, the thing also, it didn't actually cause a whole lot of extra other problems but it could have. I had to go through a whole battery of tests looking at my kidneys and my heart and has this hypertension that I've had for years damaged other parts of my body? Uh, mainly not, but so that's how we get into trouble. It, you know, if we get too um, focused on, well, let's say Zen, Doing Zen meditation can solve all my problems. That's uh, I could go into a lot about uh, panic attacks and that too in my own life, but but I'll defer that to another another time. Okay, awesome. yeah, go it's, ahead. It's also a little somewhat re relevant. I mean, they estimate only about five percent of our consciousness is of available to us so like the other 95 percent, it's like you can't reflect on it because you can't see it you have no idea what's going on in there yeah he says this uh i'll, I'll read the, i skipped this um this uh section because i wasn't sure it's just a sentence because i wasn't sure if i understood it myself or not but i'll read it since you brought that up and we'll see if it makes sense um, I'll, I'll go back to the preceding sentence. He says, the Heart Sutra teaches that form, sensation, perception, formation, and consciousness, the five skandhas, are completely empty. Of the five skandhas, form or matter is the condition by which things are seen, the condition in which this thing sees. Sensation, perception, formation, and consciousness are mental from Fun functions and cannot be seen. That's what he said. I didn't know what he actually meant by that, so I didn't. I didn't uh, read it, but um, maybe that alludes something to what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like, yeah, things are happening. We're thinking things we don't even know we're thinking. You know, that kind of thing, or there might even be things of our consciousness that's happening that we just don't have any awareness of it at all. I mean, there are, there is, there is, or there are many things like that. But even that 5% we're aware of, boy, it causes a lot of trouble. <laughs> Just think if we had 100% awareness of all of our consciousness, uh, who knows, we, we wouldn't, we probably would have survived about mm, a thousand years as a species <laughs> and we're going extinct. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Any other uh, comments? I'm wondering if you could read that little section again that you just that you just read. Just did, but I just yes, did. Okay. Of the five skandhas, form or matter is the condition in which things are seen. The condition in which this thing sees. Oh wait, that that's the same. It's the same sense. Of the five skandhas, form or matter is the condition in which things are seen the condition in which this thing sees, in which this thing sees. 
Um, then he says, sensation, perceptions, formations, and consciousness are mental functions and cannot be seen. So yeah, I mean, we can't see or realize the moment we sense something. But, yeah, that makes sense, right? Consciousness comes way after or after the the moment we we're actually sensing something, you know. That happens beneath our consciousness. Perception is the same. Formations. Formations are about the most interesting part, I think, of the five skandhas for me. Those, these are the things I think how our how our uh, how our, how our can existence has been conditioned, both individually and collectively. Uh, it, formations are like the language we learn as a native language. It just it 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 uh, comes into us. We're not really thinking about it a lot until we start to learn about English, if English is our native language, you know, in high school or, or whatever, grammar, you know, we start to learn about it. But, but so the language we speak is a formation, but there's so many other formations. I mean, they're vast. How we are conditioned to respond. Though, and I think a lot of those things come up from familial, familial, uh, circumstances, what kind of family we were raised in, and what kind of impressions were made on us when we were babies, one year, two, three, four, five, six years old. Think of all the impressions we have, on how our world gets conditioned at such an early age, but why wouldn't it be? Why wouldn't that happen? That's when our mind is just absorbing everything. And if we have a uh, parents who are lovely and supporting, that's going to shape, you know, our life versus if we do not or whatever kind. And, um, but the point is uh, we can't blame, you know, our, the conditions for whatever, whatever experience we're having. We have to go back and look at those formations ourselves and probably the most effective way of doing that is uh, one way, is uh, through meditation. Not the only way, by any chance. We learn it by everything. We learn it by doing our work, uh, you know, working, uh, just day-to-day -day work. We, we learn the same thing. Whether it be cooking or cleaning the toilets or doing a... I don't know much about doing data science, but I'm going to guess it's the same thing. Carpentry. Nice to see you, Frank. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, yeah, no, yeah, sure. Go, go ahead, Dozen. I, I wonder, in, in Buddhist theory, do these, do they build on each other? Like, does sensation... Uh, create perception, create formation, create consciousness? Like, I don't know enough about the 12-fold chain. Mm. Yeah, I, well, that's the first thing that comes up is the, uh, you know, the 12-fold chain, which may not, which not, may not have been a 12-fold chain back in Buddha's time, but, you know, that's all history and, and stuff. But Buddha certainly did lay out a, uh, a path by which the, on the arising of this is the arising of that. And, and so we sense something, we see something, uh, then we perceive, oh, good, bad, we feel, uh, you didn't have feeling in here, but uh, anyway, you know, we feel, okay, pleasant, unpleasant, you know, Dozen's charging at me, uh, he's mad, he's big, and he's like, you know, he works out a lot, and <laughs> got big muscles, and uh, it's like, he's really mad at me, you know, which has never happened, and that's why I can say it. <laughs> but uh, but uh, you know, I'm going to get things. Things are going to change. You know, my adrenaline is going to start pumping up. Uh, so it sets off sets off a, a mechanism by which one thing leads to another, and of which we're not conscious of. 
totally. So yeah, I do think there is that. <clears throat> I've always thought that feeling, this feeling of unpleasant, now that's down the line a ways, that's after we sense something and perceive something. Then we feel something. And basically in Buddhism, it's either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Neutral is like I'm going out for a walk and it's not particularly pleasant or unpleasant, but it it's okay. <laughs> something like that. And uh, and then we kind of base, you know, we we base a lot on if the feeling we have towards something is pleasant or unpleasant. And that that's a for me, that's a, a big issue that we always we have a desire, a craving to go toward the pleasant. We want to move toward the pleasant. And we want to move away from the unpleasant. Uh, so I'll start. Uh, <clears throat> I won't belabor this, but let's say if Dozen's charging at me, I, and I, I'll i just uh, say, well, OK, it's time to say, Dozen, I don't have time right now. Or uh, Dozen, uh, I need to, uh, uh, I'm going to run. <laughs> so. It's like uh, we base uh, our a lot we do on avoiding the unpleasant. Oh boy, I just had a realization about oh, I'm actually avoiding something that's quite unpleasant for me to have to deal with, that I have to deal with tomorrow. So anyway, um, and it and the more we avoid it, the harder it gets. Have you ever noticed that? Like, if you just don't take care of something right when it happens, it starts to uh, get build up and become more and more of a, feel like a substance inside of you that's harder to deal with. It creates more anxiety. You can't sleep as well, whatever. So <clears throat> that's always been a challenge for me, dealing with unpleasant things. I, I can't imagine I'm the only one, but uh, how's our time doing, Bo? Oh, we have, what made the time go to Kyoku? Go ahead, Kyoku. Uh, I think that the challenging thing is whenever I read things like this, which are uh, despite the fact that it's not the first time or the second or the third or the fourth. In other words, uh, now uh, I've read a lot of things that are trying to explain to me basically how things are. Uh, and it's very difficult to even know what I think I know. <laughs> um, uh, but to... to I keep wanting to know what it looks like. And th that really can't happen as long as I'm thinking about that uh, uh, to, to really just give myself to this life, which is already too complicated. Uh, th that I think is the really subtle part. That's the part that uh, I think meditation is a condition for uh, because uh, it, it's not until that ex, experience at some level of emptiness that uh, there there can be not so much knowing, but uh, the the actual experience itself. You know, maybe it gives rise to knowing. It it gives rise to the to uh, the next thing in, you know, in what do we call it? Emptiness, right? This or that. Uh, and that's just so different than anything I can conceive of. And every time I try to conceive of it, it sort of ends up being an obstacle, even though sometimes it it it's also, at the very least, I think, 
when I uh, kind of run into an understanding barrier uh, that at least can alert me to the uh, realization that that I'm creating an idea and that will be another obstacle. <laughs> Uh, so, th so this whole letting go thing that's necessary, uh, and that can't, it can't be, uh, I don't know, can, can it be perfected? Uh, I think really it's the, the piling up of conditions that assist that arising more than anything else. And, it makes it very challenging, I I think, to to really uh, to really let go. There's a certain way in which the less I try, the the I I think the more likely the conditions for just being uh, arise. I'm just okay. reporting on this. There's not really a question in there. I'm okay. just. Just say the last sentence again. The what can arise? Did you say? Oh, I'll ask the statement. I don't know. Okay, I, I forget things too. <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah, uh, uh, it's really I, non being in in a sense that that yeah. that the uh, the unfettered, uh, unideated. Uh, I mean, expressing it is is essentially. Uh, undoable <laughs> when mm -hmm. it comes to words. Well, yeah, and I think this is the imperative point that I, I, I again, just I can only speak from my own experience, but the only way we can see, I think, fundamentally into what this world we're living in, it fundamentally is, is to stop thinking. I, I've never had any experience yet where I've seen anything important just by my thinking. Well, anything lasts. It's, it's when the thinking stops, or like when we say things become still, or like you we say we take in the wood, we'll take a walk in the woods, and the mind quiets down, and then we we see things as they are. And that's, I mean, John Muir says some beautiful things about that, about walking in the, the forest, you know, the mountains. Very, 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 very strong Zen like uh, writings he has. And I, and I believe he experienced that. Just he he couldn't write those things without having the experience. But it's not that he was thinking so much about and you know, trying to analyze. He was just put himself there uh, without resistance. I think. Yeah, I like that phrase. It happened to me this morning when I was looking out the back door of the the dorm. And the the light, the colors, uh, I could almost, as I recall it, I could almost feel myself trying to put it into words and then backing off from putting it into words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just, really, just, you know, not so long ago, and I, you know, you hate to go back and I like to back, oh, this experience or such and such, because, well, what about now? But anyway, uh, what's your practice now? <laughs> but there was this very interesting experience we had us walking to the Zendo. It must have been, we must have been doing a um, a retreat, a session, uh, I guess. But someone brought up the fact, did you see the moon today? <laughs> uh, when when we were going to Zazen, it, was, it wasn't a full moon, it was a crescent. And it had, uh, I believe it was Venus right next to it. And there was just, crystal clear and really bright and it just stopped me in my tracks you know i just 
And someone brought it up, I think, uh, I don't know if it was a Dharma talk or someplace, but they said, did anyone see the moon today <laughs> with the planet? And I did. And yeah, it, it just it it just stops you. And that's when you see something that's real. But like you say, I think you're uh, suggesting this. I think this is the statement I was looking for when I was asking you. It arises from conditions. In other words, an experience like that cannot arise. Well, probably will not arise unless you've done you're doing some work on your own self to quiet your mind down, look at your own anxiety, your own problems, and that's what and that's what meditation is. I'm not going to mm, exalt the uh, practice of meditation into something, you know, well, exalting. Uh, it it it's, it works together with everything else in our life. But yes, we we need to do preparatory work, you know, which we don't understand what we're doing all the time. Pedagogy Roshi says in the returning to silence. You, you can realize this, if only dimly so. That's the one that's, that's mm -hmm. that I really love. It uh, sticks with me. Oh, if only dimly so. But we can. But, and the dimly so keeps us keep working. Keep working to make it bright and clear all the time. If it's possible. How are we doing on time now, Bo? 10.32. Just a little over. Okay. Okay, we stop. Uh, time to stop. Well, thank you all for your kind attention. Showing up. Okay. And thank you Good very much, you, Doka, for your talk and bringing everybody together for some chatting. Um, next Sunday, we have the memorial for Caillou Ken Ford. Um, I don't know, Dokai, if you or Kyoku want to speak a little bit about it. I'll say one thing, Bo. It's Kyu, Kyu, Kyu. Kyu, just for your information. Okay. Kyu. Kyu, Ken okay. Ford. That's all. That's all. No, I don't have much to say. We're we're uh, we're working on it. We're going to try. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then coming up, so we just finished Just Sitting today. And in November, from nine, November 9th to the 12th, we have Naturally Awake with Mark Anderson, A Direct Path to Claiming Your True Nature. November 16th to the 19th, we have Practicing the Way in This Very Moment with Onryu Kennedy and Genjo Sam Conway. And then December 2nd to the uh Oh. Judy, raise your hand. She's uh, she's going to be leading that retreat. Okay, go ahead, Bo. Don't, I won't interrupt you again. And then uh, December 2nd to the 9th, we have Rohatsu with Mio O oh and Kyoku, who is also here. Um, and there is also a link to Donna in the chat. And we can end with the four vows. Beings are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. The Buddha way is unsurpassable. I vow to realize it. Okay, thank you all.